Good morning, Wellspring family. It's so good to see you guys this morning. Let's stand up this morning as we worship our God. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and he will not grow tired or weary in his understanding no one can fathom. Let's uh, worship our God this morning as we look to him for our strength. Lift up your voices. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait. place today and and we want to uh, just acknowledge your presence here with us today. Lord, thank you for joining us. Thank you for residing in us. Thank you for inhabiting our praises. Lord, you are uh, working in and through uh, this morning. And we just invite you, Lord, to come and and to uh, that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God, have your will in us. uh, Have your way in us. May we strive and long and desire and uh, resign to your will in our hearts, God. May you receive all the glory this morning, God, as we set apart this special time of worship, even as we've been worshiping you throughout the week, Lord. What a special time as your body comes together and we look around and we see your glory in others and what you're doing. And we're just so grateful for that, Father. So have your way today, we pray. We ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen, amen. We are so glad that you're here this morning. Take just a minute and uh, maybe look for someone that you may not know their first name, and don't be embarrassed. Just ask them. How's that? We bow our hearts. We lift our hands. We turn our eyes to you again. And we surrender to the truth that all we need is found in you. Receive our adoration. Turn our eyes to one. 
receive our adoration, Jesus, Lamb of God, receive our adoration, how wonderful you are, every soul you save sings out, everything you creation standing now, lifting up your name. We're caught up in the angel song. We're gathered to your ancient throne. Children in our
lift this up. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we just uh, love you today. Thank you for what you did on, the, on that cross for us. Thank you that you did that uh, to, to please your Father, to be obedient to him. And God, what, uh, Jesus, what an example uh, for us to be o- obedient. God, we want to, uh, to be obedient to you as well. And thank you for setting out that example for us. As we turn to your word, Lord, I pray that you will speak to us individually and corporately. And uh, God, just what the need is, you know. Bring us from where we are to where you desire for us to be, we pray, God. And we just invite you into this time and this place right now and pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, Wellspring. Good morning. Good morning to you are joining us online. We're glad that you are here with us as well, which has got a kind of a growing community out there. So welcome to you guys as well. Well, as you might be aware... Uh, we've had kind of a, a shingle hanging out for a little while about an open position with our pastors here. Uh, so maybe, I, mean, I guess maybe we could throw it out because it's not too late. Anybody here want to be a pastor? Any takers? Got a couple out there? I mean, right? I mean, not such a bad gig, right? I mean, you only have to work one day a week. All the potluck you can handle. Pie socials. I mean, this is not a bad gig, right? I mean, all right, well, then again, maybe, uh, maybe maybe it's not so bad being a member of the flock either. You just get to hang out once a week with all your sheep peeps. <laughs> don't got to worry about too much, right? I mean, you don't got to worry about all the dangers out there. I mean, that's the shepherd's job, right? To keep, you know, protect the flock. Don't got to worry about figuring out where to get food from, and the shepherd's going to bring the food. I mean, you know, the shepherd's going to bring the food right to you. Practically going to put it right in your mouth. So it's not so bad being a sheep. Uh, sheep's gonna, the shepherd, rather, he's going to lead you right up to still waters and get you a nice, cool drink of water. So, ah, boy, you know, maybe not so bad being a sheep either. All right, all right. Could be a pretty sweet life. Well, frankly, I think that maybe by the time we get done with this sermon today, we're going to have a little bit better understanding about sheep shepherds and certainly the good shepherd. Let's open with prayer. Father God, as we come to this lesson, as we come to this sermon, Lord, I would ask that you would open up your word to us. Lord, that we would understand what it means to be a part of your flock. Lord, what it means that you are our shepherd. Lord, also help us to understand what it means uh, for those who have been called to shepherd the flock and how we respond to them. Lord, uh, how we respond to one another. But most importantly, Lord, we ask that we would see how we are to respond to you and be amazed by you. And Lord, be thankful for you for being our good shepherd. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, God created us, and he created us fairly smart. Yes, he did. I don't care what the media shows you out there, what you might be seeing on your news feeds. God actually created us pretty smart, but he figured some stuff he had to make simple enough for all of us to get our heads around. And so one of the things he did is throughout God's word, starting in the Old Testament, working through the New, God pretty consecutively, fairly consistently refers to us as the sheep and him as the shepherd. And we get our, idea, our heads around that. We get the idea of what shepherd and sheep, uh, kind of the relationship they have with one another, the obligations they have to one another, the relationship. Uh, and duties and responsibilities of those two roles as shepherd and sheep. And we see that, uh, well, for one thing, sheep need shepherds. Um, If you have ever raised a sheep, raise a hand out there, a couple of you, okay, some of you online. Okay, so if you've raised sheep, you know a couple things about sheep, lovable little boogers that they are. Uh, they can be a little strong-headed, a little stubborn sometimes, and get themselves into all kinds of trouble, and, and they need help. They need boundaries. They need those fences to keep them from wandering off. They need that person that helps take care of them. Otherwise, they get themselves into all kinds of trouble. And God looked down from heaven at those whom he created, and he said, yep, we sheep. <laughs> 
you're lovable, God said. I love you a lot. He said, but you, boy, you can get yourself into trouble quick. I am going to have to set up some boundaries, and I'm going to have to send you a shepherd. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about that today also. Uh, so about the shepherds out there, again, we know that God has called some people to be shepherds over the flock. And sometimes people kind of get the wrong idea about what this shepherd is, this pastor, if you will, of, of the sheep. Uh, they kind of get this like all-in-one, fix-it-in-a-can kind of guy. You know, I've been in church leadership now for well over 10 years. I've been a teacher, I've been um, a Sunday school leader over there, I've been on the elder team, I've been the elder chair, and now I'm serving as one of the staff pastors here. And there are some interesting concepts about uh, some of the things that pa pastors do, shepherds do. Some people are convinced that the pastor doesn't do much of anything. Uh, other are convinced that the pastor should be doing everything. Here's kind of a short list I came up with. Preaching, teaching, counseling, marrying, burying, healing, guiding, building, fixing, mending, lending, and being in charge of the staff, the building, the plumbing, the roof, the grounds, the finances, the little kids, the little old ladies. And don't forget, he needs to organize that missions trip, the church picnic, the church Christmas and Easter program, and of course, figure out something to do to reach the lost souls out there. And that was Monday. <laughs> That would be a busy life, right? Yeah, and sometimes, sometimes you know, that's true. But uh, is that necessarily the best way to do it? You know, is there, is there a better way to get these things broken up? Well, that's something we're looking at. Now, this idea of being a shepherd is both a noun and a verb. Uh, it's one of those interesting words that we have out there where you can both be a shepherd and you can shepherd. Uh, to be a noun is to say that the, person is, is the, the shepherd is that person who tends to the flock. He's that person that is a guide and a, and a leader to the flock, to care for the flock. Uh, it's also been called shepherd. Another word for shepherd is a herder. I don't know we're necessarily going to abandon the title pastor for herder, but you know, if you want to go that way, I guess we could. The other idea is that uh, to shepherd is also a verb. This is what, uh, what shepherds do. They take care of the flock, they protect the sheep, they guide them, they gather them, they move them from place to place, making sure that they have that what they need. And again, they uh, set direction and they provide for them. So why do sheep uh, need herders? Well, because they really, really need that guiding. They really need that protecting. Uh, it's been about 5,000 some odd years ago that the, the uh, historians tell us that man first started to uh, realize that sheep were a good livestock animal, and they've been a very valuable animal. Now, God looks at us, and he says, you know what, you're very valuable also. In fact, he says, I love you so much that I sent my son to die on the cross for you. You know, we are God's special creation. As you woke up this morning and you looked in the mirror, you are unique in every way. There's nobody else out there just like you. You are absolutely unique. Even identical twins can get up and look in the mirror and recognize that they are different than the person next to them. God made you absolutely unique, and he loves you. But he also realized that you needed a shepherd. Now, when they need help, obviously, because they don't have any true defensive mechanisms. I want you to think about it, okay? Let's go back to like an old biblical times, and you've got wolves, and you've got lions, and you've got predators, and you've got people that are going around from uh, flock to flock and stealing sheep, okay? And you've got this sheep out there all by itself standing out there in the field. Combat ready? No, you look at the sheep and you don't think combat ready, right? <laughs> no fangs, no claws. I mean, the, the, the sheep has nothing but you know, thick wool as a kind of a defensive mechanism. Other than that, it is prey waiting to happen. So sheep absolutely need to be protected. And so mankind figured out kind of early on that for as valuable as sheep were, it was worth it to have somebody that was appointed to shepherd the sheep. They're really valuable and they really need the help. Well, of course, sheep also have a role to play in all this also. We're putting all this on the shepherd so far, but the sheep kind of have a, an obligation, a responsibility to this also. Anybody ever, ever had that, that leadership person, that role model in their life, that person that was trying to do good for them and they just failed to listen to them and kind of went their own way? Anybody here have a mom or a dad? <laughs> Anybody here grow up? <laughs> And now we get that idea. Sometimes we rebel against authority. Sometimes we don't like being told what to do. Even if it's our, for our best interest, even if it's good for us, we get the idea that sometimes we don't listen and sometimes we don't follow along. Again, sometimes sheep can be a little stubborn, but then again, they can also be loving and cute and cuddly too. I didn't say that. And it's a good thing we don't have mics in the auditorium. <laughs> We're going to use, uh, instead of that, we'll say that sheep sometimes don't make the most informed decision. <laughs> you at home can figure out what word got planted in there. 
Well, we're going to go back. Let's pick up some biblical precedents here. So I want to take a look at uh, God's Word. There's going to be a handful of verses that we're going to put onto this topic. But as, as we want to go back, and we'll start with a verse that I know that many of you probably are familiar with in Psalm 23. You can turn there if you'd like. We're going to be coming back to it a little bit later. Uh, but Psalm 23 begins with this, these couple of verses. Maybe you know it. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All right, we, can, we, can go, we got more and we'll probably get there, just saying. <laughs> but get it, right off the bat, we start getting an idea about how God handles this role as, of him being the shepherd and us being his flock. Right off, we start to see some things. First of all, God is our first and our primary shepherd. Also, we see that he's the owner, okay? God is the owner of the flock, and he tends to us perfectly. He provides for us everything that we need. There is nothing that we truly need that God has not provided. Now, don't get me wrong. There's lots of stuff out there that we want, amen? But God gives us everything that we need. Where we start getting frustrated, where we start getting anxious, is when we start saying, God, I want this. And I'm like, no, no, wait a minute, God. No, I need this, God. I really need this. And God's like, you really don't need that. You want that, I get it. But God says, everything that you truly need, I have provided for you. And this is where, as we follow the Lord, and we accept God's word to be true, and we seek his will, we make his will more important than our will. I remember growing up, no, not gro well, growing up as a Christian anyway, but I remember being a young Christian, and my mentor, Jerry Applegarth, one of the things that really just, uh, that just amazed me about this man is he was so calm and at peace with all things. I remember one time we were, we, were right, uh, we were driving on an icy road in the middle of a crash waiting to happen, sliding out of control, and the words that came out of his mouth were, oh my. I'm clawing at the glass, I'm trying to sink up the, 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 the belt, I mean, I'm doing everything I can to try and preserve life, and the man was just as calm. So the crash is over, and we're estimating the damage, and, he, and, and again, it's just like, huh. That was it, that was his whole response. Well, I say, I tell you that story because as I have hopefully matured a little bit in Christ, one of the things that I've realized, I said a little bit, I heard some laughs out there. One of the things that I've realized is that I am a lot more comfortable with where I'm at in life when I recognize and I trust and I just, I come to the, the acceptance that God has provided everything I need. When I start focusing on the things I want, I get frustrated, I get anxious, and I want it, and I want it now. When I sit back and I go, you know what, God? You've already taken care of everything that I need. You sent your son to die on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven. You've secured an open door to heaven for me. You have provided everything that I need. You have given me life. Everything I need, you have given to me. And when I start trusting in that, relying on that, and realizing, you know what, my shepherd, my shepherd's got this. All I gotta do is just kind of relax. Now, it doesn't say that it's wrong to want things. That's fine to want things and to seek after things. But we need to trust, relax, and be a part of God's flock and just let him shepherd us. So, again, we see that God has tended to the things that we need. And he leads us besides green pastures. And we can feed there. We can grow healthy there. And he leads me beside still waters so that I can be refreshed, so that I can be sustained. He restores. He heals our spirit. When it's all broken and everything around us is falling apart and I just feel like falling apart, God says, I restore you. He leads, he guides, he puts us on the right path. We call that the path of righteousness. It's right according to God's ways. And he does it for his namesake. He does it so that we can be a blessing to him. He does it to magnify and to glorify what we can do for him through the lives that we have. God is good all the time. Well, as for us, well, okay, so part of that is accepting that we are God's flock. Look with me in Psalm 79, 13. He says, but we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. So right away, we get another idea here. God is in control of all things, and God owns all things. Not only are we the sheep of his pastures, so not only are we his flock, but he owns the pasture too. So all that stuff out there that we get anxious about, that we think we need to have all those, you know, the, the property or possessions and all that stuff, it's all God's. So we should not want or be anxious about these things either, but we should give thanks forever from generation to generation, as he says, recounting his praise because of what he has already done for us. Psalms 103 says that, 
uh, tells us to know that the Lord, he is God. Know that he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Again, the psalmist says, recognize that God is in control. Recognize that we are his flock and allow him to shepherd us. In Psalm 24, one, it's made clear, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Now, if you see a theme developing here, let me know. God's in control, we're God's flock. God is, not only is, uh, are we his flock, but God owns everything. It's all God's. And so we give back to the Lord, being thankful for all that he has done for us. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because if you don't know anything else about scripture and you'd never read the Psalm before, you could go back to the very beginning of this book and you read like Genesis 1.1, we're gonna start there and we should be done about next uh, Wednesday of next year. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created everything. So this isn't a new idea for us to understand that everything that is out there belongs to the Lord. And we're tending it. We're stewards of it, God says. Then God says, okay, I've given you these things. What are you gonna do? I've given you this pasture. You're my flock. Go out there and enjoy it. I've led you to it. What are you gonna do with it? So what do you call sheep without a shepherd? Short-lived. We really need a shepherd. Yeah, sheep are prone to wander. They look for greener pastures. They're easily led astray. They will even walk directly into harm's way. I remember growing up down South County. I know, I'm from South County. We had a lot of sheep down South County and it floods down there every so often. I remember friends of mine had sheep in these big fields and they had these little, little knolls, little knobs out there. I mean, the high ground in this field was maybe six feet high, right? So it wasn't much of a knob. And it would flood and you'd look out there and there'd be all these sheep standing out there on this little knob. Like a hundred of them, right? And they're all packed around this thing. Now, a hundred yards off to the side, okay, this field went up onto high ground and that place never flooded. Every time it flooded, where were the sheep? Out on that little knob in the middle, surrounded by water. And here's the farmer waiting out there, waist deep, trying to get these sheep over to dry land. Sheep don't always make the most informed decisions <laughs> and they need a shepherd to guide them. Okay. Sheep are easy prey to hunters. We've talked about that. And what an amazing benefit it is. What an amazing blessing it is for sheep to have a shepherd that loves them and takes the time to care for them and to provide for them. It doesn't do them any good though if they refuse to listen to the direction of their shepherd. Back in Psalms 23, we're gonna look more at this a little bit later on, but David, who's the author of that Psalm, he says that the Lord, as he's talking to him, he said his rod and his staff, they comfort him. Well, we know that the shepherd carries a rod and a staff. One is to kind of help guide the sheep. The other one is to help correct the sheep and also to protect them from enemies that, that might come along. God does that for us. God leads us, God guides us, God helps to put us on the path of righteousness. He helps kind of steer us in the right direction so he can move us from one good field to another good field. When we start going off down dangerous paths, God kind of guides us and puts us on the right path. There's enemy, the enemies that come our way too. Did you know, as you might have heard me say in the past, Satan doesn't particularly care for you. Satan and his, and, his, uh, and his demons would love to see you fall aside. They would love, he would love to be able to steal you from the flock He'd love to see you devoured. And so our God comes along and protects us also. Well, he also has shepherds, men, and he's put in charge of the church to lead, to guide, to protect the flock as well. And we never forget, for those of us that are called to that position, it's not our flock, God's flock. It's God's sheep, it's God's pasture. Well, let's look at Matthew 9, 36 through 37. Jesus, as he was passing through, he saw, he saw the crowds. He says in Matthew 9, 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest indeed is plentiful, but the workmen are few. Jesus looked and he said, man, we need more shepherds. Jesus looked out and he said, there are sheep out there that are ready to join my flock but there aren't enough shepherds out there doing the work. He said, the field is ripe, it's plentiful, but the workmen are few. God has every desire and every t intention of seeing lost sheep saved. And he wants to see the saved sheep well fed. And he does that perfectly from heaven. And he works through the leaders that he put, appoints to do it here on earth. 
And we all have our place in the family of God. We all have the, our role that we fill in this flock. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 says that some people have been, some men have been specifically called to these positions of leadership. Uh, Paul says that uh, he gave some to be apostles. That is God, gave some to be apostles. He gave some to be prophets. He gave some to be evangelists and some he called to be pastors and teachers. The job description for those that are called to be pastors and teachers in the next verse, verse 12, he says, for the perfecting of the saints, that is to lead them, to guide the saints. For the work of the ministry, that is to counsel, to equip, to be there, to come alongside the flock. For the edifying of the body of Christ, that is to teach, to mentor, to disciple. God's word repeatedly talks about the role of those who would pastor or shepherd the flock. As Jesus was talking with Peter in John 21, verses 15 and through 17, it's a little bit later after Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. Remember Peter in the garden, three times he was asked, hey, aren't you that guy that was with Jesus? And three times Peter said, wasn't me, I, I don't know who that guy is. Three times Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. And when he realized what he'd done, and it was exactly what Jesus had said he would do, he just broke his heart. But when he saw the risen Savior again, three times the Lord asked him, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, you know I do. Yes, do you love me? He said, I know, you know I do. Three times. And three times the Lord said to him, I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to shepherd my flock. I want you to feed my sheep. So I want you to take care of them. Raise up the little ones. Take care of the family. Take care of the flock of God and make sure that they're well fed. Now, we're not having a potluck later this afternoon. That's not where this is going, but that would be a great segue. But part of the feeding that we get that nourishes us, that makes us stronger, is the feeding and the nourishment of God's word. The teaching that comes from God's word and the leadership and the guidance that comes from God's word is that which feeds us and nourishes us. And he said, I want you to feed the sheep. In Acts 20, verse 28, Paul told, the, uh, told us shepherds, he said, for you, you people that are shepherding the flock, he said, be on guard for yourselves. Be on guard for yourselves. Watch yourselves, shepherds. Because remember, the, remember, flock, there are enemies out there, and there are dangers out there. There are raging rivers and steep cliffs, and there are physical enemies out there. So he said, be on guard for yourselves also, shepherds, and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own, with his own blood. So Paul makes it very clear, a couple things. He says, okay, for those of you who are in leadership roles, watch out for yourselves and watch out for your flock. He says, remember, it is God's Holy Spirit that has given you the gift and the calling to be a shepherd over the flock and never, ever forget that the flock belongs to God, that God purchased this flock with the blood of Jesus Christ, not our flock. In 1 Peter verses five, or chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, Peter took the Lord's command. The Lord, remember he said, he said, feed the lambs, shepherd the, shepherd the flock, feed the flock. Well, Peter took that advice, and when he wrote his letters to us that we now read, he says this in 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those who entrusted to you, who are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. The day being a pastor becomes being about the pastor, well, then everything has gone bad in the pasture. It's not about the person that stands up here and brings the message. It's not about the person that's leading the, the teaching that goes on in the Sunday school classes or about the visitations or the counseling or any of the other roles that leadership fills. It's not about these people. It's about God because we are all his flock and it's all his pasture. About 400 AD or so, St. Augustine, a prominent Afrin Catholic bishop, he described the role of the pastor. He said that we ought to do something like this. He said, uh, the disturbers are to be rebuked the low-spirited to be encouraged, the infirm to be supported, objectors confuted, the treacherous guarded against, the unskilled taught, the lazy aroused, the contentious restrained, the haughty repressed, 
Litigants pacified, the poor relieved, the oppressed liberated, the good approved and the evil born with, and, and, and all are to be loved. Well, we were great right to the end, right? <laughs> Nobody said it was an easy job. God's given some great examples of, of pastors. Uh, Abraham was a pastor, Jacob and all 12 of the nation, of the, of the leaders, the patriarchs of the tribe of Israel were, pastor, or were uh, shepherds rather. Moses was a shepherd, the young David was a shepherd. The prophet Amos was a shepherd and there was a group of shepherds that were given a special message on one evening that a baby was born in Bethlehem. God uses shepherds, absolutely. Now, are they all good shepherds? Well, some of them, we try. Do we get it right all the time? No, no, but we try. There is one good shepherd and there's only one true good shepherd. And we desire to serve him, and we try and serve him, and we do the best we can, but he is our one true and good example. In John 10, 14, I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 10, if you would. Turn with me to John 10. We're going to be there. We're going to camp there for just a little bit. John chapter 10. Jesus talked about himself, and of, of himself, Jesus said several times that he said, I am the good shepherd. Now, if you look at the I am statements as Jesus talked about himself, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There's lots of things that Jesus said about himself. One of them was this, I am the good shepherd. Now, we've talked a little bit about what a shepherd is and what a shepherd does. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But Jesus says here, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the right example. Okay? And he says, I know my own and my own know me. Let's look at this in... Uh, Look at this in, first, in uh, John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger, they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. In the first five passages there, Jesus comes across this idea that, there are, that Satan and false prophets will come along like thieves and like robbers. They'll climb over the walls, they'll climb through the windows because the thieves, the robbers, and Satan, again, would love to see the flock of God decimated. He would love to come and lead you astray and into harm's way. He would love to see you destroyed. And yet Jesus says here in verse five, and in, in another place he said, look, he said, the sheep, they know my name. Verse three, he says, his voice, he calls to his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Verse five, he says, a stranger, they simply will not follow, but they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. How are you gonna know whether it's God, whether it's the Lord speaking to you or whether it's Satan? Now, I watched a couple videos and I tried to find a good one that I could bring to you this morning, but I know we got a busy morning, so I'm just gonna relate this to you, but it was really cool watching this. And they, they had several videos of people going out into these flock and the sheep are out over the hillside. And they had these students that were trying to call the sheep down out of the hill. And they'd call to them, here, sheep, 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 sheep. You know what the sheep did? Nothing, nothing. Didn't respond, didn't react, nothing. Okay, had another student get up there and he called it there, you know, here, sheep, 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 sheep. Nothing. Now, the owner of the flock, the shepherd, he got up there and he entered and he went, yoot, 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 yoot. All these sheep, whoop, heads came up. Right down they started to come. The sheep recognized the voice of their shepherd. They recognized his calling. And when he called, they came. How do you know? Well, for one reason is because those sheep spend a lot of time with that shepherd. And they have seen that shepherd tend to them, take care of them, provide for them. They've heard the way that he talks and they've, they've, they've got to become comfortable with him. Some stranger comes along the way, they're like, I don't know who this is. I'm not gonna follow them. So when we wanna know what our, if our Lord is the one that's speaking to us, we need to spend time with our Lord. We need to spend time with our good shepherd. We need to spend time with God's word so that we're comfortable with what it says. 
So that if somebody comes along and tells us something, tries to share something, impress something upon us that is not from God's word, we will recognize that that is from a stranger and not follow along with it. Let's pick up again in verse six. This figure of speech that Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were because he'd been, uh, that he had been saying to them. They didn't get it. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have, a, they may have life and they may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus says, I am the gate. Jesus said in other verses, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. There's only one way to that pasture, that heavenly pasture, that good land, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was speaking to them and teaching them through a context that they would understand. In those days, in those regions, sheep were very common. They were everywhere. And the shepherd would bring the sheep down out of the field. He would bring them out of the wilderness. He would bring them to a place of rest, to a place of safety. He would bring them through the sheep gate into the pen where they would be safe. And he would check off, he would have his staff and he would lower his staff down. He would hold his staff out and he would check the sheep as they came through, checking to make sure that they were there, that they weren't injured. He tended to that flock very well. Jesus is telling him, he says, I am the shepherd. I am the good shepherd who brings the, the, the sheep in and brings them into the pen, into safety. The point that we get out of this, the story that he's saying, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. No man gets to heaven except through Christ. He is the shepherd that tends to the flock. Verse 12. Jesus says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand, and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus said, I take this shepherding stuff seriously. I put the value of those sheep over my own safety. The hired man, the man that's, that, that isn't in it from the heart, that isn't in it from the calling of God, he sees the danger coming, he's like, Peace, I'm out of here. When the going gets tough, they get gone. Jesus said, the going got tough and I stood my ground for you. I died on the cross for you to save you, to protect you from the ultimate enemy out there, your own sin and death. I am, he's qualified to say that he is the good shepherd. Verse 16, he said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Look at that in verse 16. Look at that flock. Jesus' ultimate goal here, he says is that we will hear his voice and we will be one flock with one shepherd. That is not the flock of Wellspring Bible Fellowship. That is the flock of God. And one day the flock will be gathered together as one flock in heaven under one shepherd. Verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Jesus was obedient to the Father's plan. And it was the, the Father's plan that he would live and die, be placed into that tomb. That three days later, as he said he would, he would take up his own life again. He said, nobody takes my life from me. The, the, the God's word says that he gave up his spirit. It was the right time. He said, oh, as I have the authority to lay it down, he said, I also have the authority to take it up again. All by the authority of God's plan. In verses, uh, verses 19 and 20, an important question gets asked down here. Verse 19 says, a division occurred among the Jews because of these words. 
Many of them were saying he has a demon and he's insane. Why do you listen to him? That's a good question. That's a good question that we need to answer. The world out there is going to, is going to be held accountable for the answer to this question. He said, this guy Jesus is nuts. Why are you listening to him? He's a demon. He's evil. Why are you listening to him? My question is, if you are listening to him, why are you listening? Is he nuts? Is he evil? Or is he God? C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, wrote this. He said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis said, that is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, nor did he intend to do so. Joshua said in 24, 15, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Yeah. Well, we can't boast too much about this because in Isaiah 53, verse six, we read this. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his, own, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This prophetic statement makes some couple things very clear. Every one of us has been that sheep that wandered. Every one of us has been that sheep that looked at the flock, looked at the shepherd, saw the safety and said, yeah, but there's some really green grass over here. That, that's good looking grass. We've all wandered away. We've all separated ourselves from the safety of the shepherd and from the safety of the flock. And because of that, because each one of us needed that rescuing from our own disobedience, from our own rebellion, God says that he laid that iniquity, he laid that consequence, he laid that shortcoming on his son, Jesus Christ, when he put him on that cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he took all of that with him so that we could be rescued, so that he could grab us the silly lost sheep, and save us from ourselves. God loved you so specifically, so uniquely, right where you sit, that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to rescue you personally. A more amazing, a more loving shepherd we could never know. And this is why Jesus is qualified to save himself. I am the good shepherd. We have been called to be shepherds of God's flock, we're trying to live up to the example that he left for us. We are all part of God's flock and answerable to him as our good shepherd. One day, those who have been called into the position of being shepherds will answer to that good shepherd. Someday, anyone who has been called into that position of leadership, regardless of where it may be, is going to stand before that good shepherd and he's going to look at us and ask that question, what would you do with the sheep? What would you do with the flock while they were yours to watch over? Did you feed them? Did you shepherd them? Did you take care of them? Anybody want to be a pastor now? <laughs> Suddenly that job description, I mean, remember, it's only one day a week, right? <laughs> I'm going to break this down up on the screen. If you'd like to turn Psalm 23 in your Bible, you can, but we're going to, we're going to look at it on the screen. But I want you to take a look. Why don't you take a look at our good shepherd, what God does for us. As David wrote this in Psalm 23, he was speaking to the Lord God. He used the word Yahweh there for the Lord God. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He makes that connection with him and the Father as our shepherd. I want you to look, because this psalm is still true for us. It's a beautiful psalm. It appears all over the place. But I want you guys to look at it for maybe just a, maybe a, a different set of eyes this morning. 
David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Look at that list, guys. He, he leads us to the pastures. He leads us to the waters. He restores the soul. He does the guiding. He defends me and protects me with his rod and with his staff. He does all the work. God, our good shepherd, does all the work, and we get all the blessings. It's good to be a part of the flock. It is amazing. Think about that, how amazing it is to be a part of the flock. You get to travel in safety, knowing that God, your shepherd, has protected you, defended you, prepared you, led you, given you everything that you truly need. Now, I know it's not everything you might want, and there is green grass over there, but your shepherd says, you know what? You've got the grass you need. Be happy. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because my shepherd has given me everything that I need. Rest on the comfort of our shepherd. God has given us everything that we need. He has done all the work and we receive all the blessing if I will do this one simple little thing. Follow him. Will I follow Jesus? The shepherd can lead, the shepherd can guide, the shepherd knows the right path to take to get us where we need to be. We have to be willing to follow. I'm gonna ask you something, guys, today. Close your Bibles for a minute. I just want you to listen for a second. If you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your good shepherd, or maybe you realize that you haven't really been following your shepherd very well, if you've, never, if you've never said, you know what, Lord, I want you to be my shepherd. I want to be a part of your flock. You here today or you listening at home, I want you to consider if maybe today might be a good day to do that. If you realize that you're a part of the flock, but the shepherd is way over there, would you consider drawing closer to the shepherd today? Jesus wants his flock to be united. He wants the flock together. That's part of what a shepherd does, is he keeps the flock together. Scattered sheep are dangerous, are, are, are danger to themselves. They're in, they're in harm's way. God wants the flock to have unity, to come together. Would you consider drawing close to the flock? Would you allow him to rescue you from the dangers that you have placed yourself into, from the dangers of the world that exist out there? Would you allow him to guide you on the paths of righteousness, that is his right paths that lead to safety and provision? Would you let your good shepherd guide you home? Home to that, that pin of safety, that, that heavenly pasture, if you will, where one day all of God's flock will be gathered together under the one good shepherd. As it says in God's word today, if you would hear his call, if you would hear his voice, would you recognize that that is the good shepherd calling you? Would you listen to it? Would you respond to it? Would you follow him? Or would you stay out in the, out in the field where dangers are? In your head, in your heart, in your very spirit, I want everybody to close their eyes. Just close your eyes for a minute. Unless you're listening online and you're driving, then don't close your eyes. I want you just to listen. What's the good shepherd saying to you? What is his voice telling you? 
Is he calling? Is he encouraging? Is he trying to guide you onto a path? Is he warning you about a path that you're on? Is he trying to rescue you? Psalm 95, 7, the shepherd says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice. The shepherd Paul in the New Testament said, As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the time of favor. Now is the day of salvation. The good shepherd is calling. He's calling to you. If you're listening to this at home, I would ask that you pray. If you're listening to this message online, there's a section where you can leave comments down below. If you'd like to receive more information, we would love to communicate with you. There's an, an app for Wellspring that you can download, and there's information there. If you hear your shepherd calling your voice today, don't ignore his voice. Would you respond? If you're sitting here in this auditorium today, if you're hearing this word today, and you have never said yes to the good shepherd, if you have never said yes, Lord, I realize that I have wandered, but Lord, I want to be rescued. I want to be saved. I want to be a part of your flock. I want to be tended to, guided, provided for, rescued, and one day led to that heavenly pasture to be safe eternally under that one true good shepherd, you Lord Jesus Christ. If you agreed to follow the Lord and then for him to be your shepherd at one point, but you realize, ah, I'm not following very closely. I'm, I'm that sheep that he has to keep going after. Would you pray, Lord, help me to draw near. Help me to follow and to be obedient to your calling. If you hear the Lord calling you today, if you hear his voice, let today be the day of your salvation. Father God, Lord Jesus, good shepherd, we bring this message to an end, but we ask that it would be the beginning. The beginning, Lord, of a relationship, the resurgence, the renewing of a relationship with you at its head, with you as our shepherd, with you leading, guiding, providing, saving, rescuing us as needed. Lord, that we would have a recommitment or a new commitment to be your flock. Lord, that as a sheep, we would not be stubborn or bullheaded, that we would be submissive, that we would be willing to put aside our own wants, our own desires, and to be happy, to be content with all that you have provided. You have given us green pastures. You have given us still waters. All that we need, you have provided. Lord, help us to be comfortable with that. Help us to accept that. Lord, help us to be a good sheep in your flock. Jesus, we love you. You have given everything that you could for us. You lived and died on that cross for us. By your own authority, you took up your own life. And even now, today, you are at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us as our good shepherd. So yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We are your sheep. We desire to serve you. And Lord, we are so thankful for all that you have done for us that we give ourselves back to you. To you be all glory forever and ever. Amen.